Hi, and welcome to this presentation about the relationship between innovation and institutions. My name is Johannes Glückle, and together with my colleague Yannick Eckhardt, we have conducted research on the question of how an innovation that is pro actually prohibited in a particular jurisdiction may still gain legitimacy and establish itself and so lead to institutional change. We also propose an original new mechanism of institutional change that we call institutional folding and that I will describe in more detail in this presentation. But let's start first in the context of the global beer industry. So today, the beer industry globally is so highly concentrated that the five largest groups in the world account for almost 60% of global beer production. These groups are highly industrialized. They exploit economies of scale. They rationalize the use um, of raw materials and they automate towards mass production in order to gain cost effectiveness. Now, as early as in the 1980s, a counter movement to the industrialized beers has originated in the United States of America, the so-called craft movement. It started as a counter movement to respond to the increasing fatigue with the homogeneity of taste. And it's very quickly spread across the globe. Today, in most countries, you can have um, artisanal beers, um, beers crafted by very small and microbreweries, and that create much more variety in tastes and flavors. Exactly for that reason, it is also that these craft beers are a good example of innovation. Because one of the main characteristics of craft brewers is their enthusiasm for processing creative ingredients. So here we are actually discussing about a real innovation. And now comes the real puzzle. Because in the particular region of Bavaria, one of the globally perhaps most reputed and popular regions in the world of beer, just in Bavaria, the brewing of creative beers is forbidden because it is against a very old and traditional law. It's the so-called purity law that was established in 1516 and which is now more than 500 years old. So that is a case of what we call illicit innovation. But let's begin uh, with the terminology. Innovation generally should not be imagined as something very easy and quick. It would be naive to believe that innovations would always be apparent and obvious in the use value or in the value added that they would offer to the, to the existing situations. Instead, it is always arduous, even if it is uh, obviously much better than anything before. Because whereas new knowledge offers benefits for the innovators and the adopters, at the same time, it is often detrimental for others who are invested in the incumbent technologies and who do everything to avoid that the new innovation spreads. Nobody wants to lose power when innovation occurs. So in this context of arduousness, I distinguish two different types of innovations. The first one is controversial innovation. Controversial innovation refers to a situation in which the superiority of the innovation is at least ambiguous and even partially resisted. So think of any new idea that comes up in a company and where the management board and many other colleagues would say, well, we've seen that, we don't believe it really works, so maybe we better not support it. Illicit innovation is an even more specific type of controversial innovation where it meets resistance not on the ground of a lack of legitimacy, but rather because it directly contradicts the law. It is illicit. So the research question for this talk today is, how is it possible to reconcile the rise of an innovative practice, here craft brewing, with a geographical jurisdiction where violation of the incumbent practice is actually illicit? So, in order to, um, to, to tackle this research question, um, I propose or we propose jointly um, the following approach. 
we adopt a perspective of institutions. Institutions are increasingly recognized as key drivers or success factors in whether innovations fail or succeed. Institutions, as we define them here in this paper, because we know that there is a very broad and sometimes conflictive understanding of the very term, institutions here are understood as the relatively stable patterns of social interactions based on mutual expectations among the participant actors and that are enforced by sanctions in case of non-compliance with those expectations. We define institutions exactly in this specific way because we exclude written laws and, and constitutions and regulations from that very term. And we do that for good reason, because empirically we can see that, as other researchers have demonstrated, that sometimes policy changes don't lead to changes in political outcomes. So you can re-regulate, but maybe there's no change in the practice. And sometimes there are changes in the political outcomes without any change in the regulations. Obviously so, written norms and texts and laws on the one hand are important in the way that they do in effect structure social practice, but they are not fully aligned with this practice. So we argue that institutions, the stable patterns of interactions, actually moderate the relationship between regulations and social outcomes. So let's have a quick view on the study region of Bavaria. On this map you can see the territory of Germany and Bavaria as the free federal state that hosts 40% uh, of all breweries located in, in, in Germany. There is a total of almost 650 breweries located in the jurisdiction of Bavaria. Bavaria is home to the world's biggest hop-growing region. It is also home to the world's most famous university located in Weinstefan and of course also the home of the globally known Oktoberfest. In this geographical context of Bavaria, we have conducted over a dozen in-depth interviews with different stakeholders and participants of the organizational field of beer brewing in Bavaria, including um, old style and new style breweries, representatives of the old brewer associations as well as representatives of the new creative brewer associations, state bureaucrats and researchers and teachers in the area of um, vocational training and research on beer. Based on uh, a qualitative content analysis of all this interview material, we would like to propose a theory of a particular change mechanism for institutions, and that is the concept of institutional folding. So let me briefly outline how this works. First of all, we do have the traditional purity law and its underlying purity norm that was established in 1516 and that has prevailed over more than 500 years. On the other hand, the craft brewers in Bavaria have organized into a new um, creative brewer association. So they call themselves creative brewers and they have invested um, intelligence to come up with a new counter norm. And that counter norm is the norm of naturalness. So the way they theorize this new norm is by folding the new norm over the old norm in ways that simultaneously legitimize the new norm and delegitimize the old norm. So how does that work in principle? This is just a graphical representation to help understand this notion of folding. The purity norm says that beer must be brewed only and exclusively with the use of water, malt, hops and yeast. Over time, and due to the industrialization of beer production, however, the current regulations accept and tolerate the use of technical and chemical additives, for example, in the filtering process of beer. The creative brewers, they endorse the core of the purity law. They say it's great to brew beers with those four ingredients. But in addition to that, 
we would also like to include an unlimited number of natural ingredients. It's the naturalness that should rule how we brew beers. And at the same time, due to this amendment of the new norm, that new norm delegitimizes at the same moment the practice of using chemicals and other additives and flavors and colorants in beers that sometimes are permitted. So in the empirical practice, this works uh, in a number of ways. Um, and we have organized them around the key criteria of institutional logics that define the purity law. First of all, quality. Creative brewers um, speak about the quality of their beers and they highlight that in contrast to them, some, not all of course, but some of the traditional brewers are more inclined to focus on technical optimization than in producing quality beers. The same for authenticity. A creative brewer said that, what am I supposed to make a mango beer without mangoes, for example? So here we see that new ingredients that are traditionally not understood in the brewing culture come into play to produce new flavors. And at the same time, they delegitimize the purity brewing because what happens in the beer production is that new cultures and new flavor hops are cultivated where the hops carry a taste of fruit or some other, some other uh, um, natural product without actually having this natural product in it. Thirdly, Purity brewers argue that they are uh, justified by a very long tradition of 15, 16, of more than 500 years of unchanged regulation. However, creative brewers demonstrate that in the course of history, there have been quite a number of changes in the law, but those changes did not prevail over many years. And at some point, the construction of the purity law as, as of today is somehow a reconstruction of a specific history, not of all the history. And there are certain types of beers that were brewed already in 1540 under the law that today would not be allowed according to the law, but the creative brewers in fact brew them. The second stage of institutional work necessary to be successful with institutional folding is putting the norm into practice. And we have, we have seen three types of entanglements where creative brewing is deeply involved and intermingled with uh, traditional brewing. First of all, all, with no exception, all of our creative brewers um, brewed creative brews and at the same time they were engaged in the production of uh, beer according to the purity law. This um, entanglement of production allowed those brewers to also become members of the traditional brewer associations as well as they were members of the creative brewers association. Um, a case of intercohesion, of organizational co-membership. And thirdly, we have seen by talking to researchers and trainers and by reading the course descriptions at university programs, that increasingly old and new brewing knowledge gets cross-fertilized in different courses and promoted by researchers, as this statement um, of um, a lecturer at a vocational school illustrates. Now that we have seen how creative brewers have managed by entanglement and normative institutional folding to gain the legitimacy in the market vis-a-vis -vis their competitors and other stakeholders, the question remains as to how the state actually enforces the purity law against creative brewers. Now, reading the written regulations, we learn that you could even be sentenced to jail if you violated um, the purity law um, various times. However, our reading of the news never provided any such case to us. So what we did was to look at the beer inspection that the state authorities regularly or annually conduct um, on, all the brewer on a selected sample of breweries in Bavaria. We can see that in 2016, the year of the 500th anniversary of the purity law, was also the year with the highest number of beer inspections over a longer time period. 
So we see that the purity law was especially seemingly con at least controlled um, in that very year of the anniversary, but then afterwards the number again uh, decreased. What we can also, say, uh, also see is that contestations of beer are hardly ever for health risks. So um, more than 99% of all the beers are fine in terms of health risks. But we do see that there are a number of contestations involved um, for composition, and that is a violation of the purity uh, law. Now, beer inspections are not enforcement yet. And we know that beer inspections, once they are positive or they find um, non-compliance, are reported to the state authorities. However, in many cases and in most cases, uh, when we talked to the creative brewers, they said that there were no sanctions imposed to them. So how is this possible? A creative brewer said, I have never had any problems with the office so far. We have three people in charge at the district office and one of them is also a brewer who knows his way around a bit better. He can look behind the scenes and say that this is a not so good regulation. And we had a state bureaucrat in our interview who said, as long as it runs on this basis of a gentleman agreement, as it does now, we see no need for action. One can vividly imagine what public opinion and the tabloid press would do if one were to lay a hand on the purity law. Political suicide to try to change the law of purity, but not to enforce the law of purity because there is increasing legitimate alternative practice that obviously is possible under a gentleman's agreement. So let us summarize the empirical evidence of the case. Craft brewing, the global movement, hits Bavaria, a jurisdiction in which only purity brewing is legally allowed and all other forms, types and ways of brewing are legally forbidden by, um, by, by strong legally possible sanctions. However, we hardly find many sanctions. Instead, what we see is a special process through which the creative brewers as institutional entrepreneurs have managed to gain legitimacy for creative brewing. How did they do this? They did it by creating a new norm and folding it over the old. And they did it by entangling a number of practices in production, in, uh, in knowledge use, um, and in co-memberships and intercohesion in order to establish that legitimacy. So what happened is that from a situation of institutional circumvention, where a divergent new institution is different from the regulation, actually gains increasing legitimacy through institutional folding in a way that converts the situation into one of institutional competition, a situation in which the regulation is no longer enforced given the increasing legitimacy of the new innovation or the new institution in this case. Let me conclude. We have uh, described in the empirical case and we have abstracted into a more conceptual framework that folding includes two stages of institutional work. One, the theorization of new norms, and two, the entanglement of old and new practices in ways that gain the legitimacy of the, of the dominant part of members in the organizational field. Therefore, folding is especially suitable in positions of weak power, in situations where new players, where fringe players, try to get into a field and transform the dominant practices. Here, strategies of folding are more likely um, to bring change than uh, um, immediate confrontation or strategies of institutional cleavage. Thank you so much for your attention. If you're interested in this research, I'd like to refer you to the article that is uh, published in uh, the Journal of Economic Geography this very year. Thank you.